Thanks for joining this Interfaith Clergy Discussion on Thanksgiving 2021. We're joined for this discussion by Larry Hayward, a pastor at Westminster Presbyterian Church, Grace Hahn, pastor at Trinity Methodist, Rabbi Stephen Rain, who leads the Agudas Akim congregation, uh, and uh, Robin Rosino, the rector at the Church of St. Clement. I'm John McCardle. I'm a member of Westminster Presbyterian. Quick show of hands to start this discussion. As members of clergy, uh, are you always the one, when you sit down for Thanksgiving dinner finally, are you always the one who's asked to give the blessing? Yes? So Stephen Brain, uh, how will your blessing when you sit down to Thanksgiving this year be different from the one than the blessing that you gave a year ago? Um, so when I think about the blessing that I offered in my, really my community last year, it was focused on uh, this, this, the story of, of Jacob where he sort of rests his head on this pile of rocks and he says, you know, God was in this place, so I didn't even know it. And I was asking the community last year to sort of, sort of close their eyes and imagine you know, who are the people that they wanted around their Thanksgiving tables that perhaps uh, were unable to be there and to you know, imagine those conversations and the, the warmth uh, of their presence. And I think this year, many of us have the opportunity to not just imagine, but to really experience uh, that and to, uh, to express gratitude. I think so, so many years on Thanksgiving, we, you know, we go around the table and it's, you know, thanks for my health and thanks for grandma and grandpa. And it, it's, it's, it seems sometimes trite, but I think this year it's an opportunity to really express that gratitude of what it means to be in the presence of the people that we care about and love most. Grace Han, you're, you're not always the one who's asked to give the blessing? No, I actually, we have a lot of clergy in our family. So both of my parents are clergy. My father-in-law is clergy. My husband also went to seminary. So there's no shortage of people who can offer blessings. <laughs> I usually get to do the prayer over the children's tables. So maybe that counts. <laughs> so, uh, so how will that prayer, that children's prayer, be different mm. this year than last year? You know, I feel like children really kind of understand gratitude in a way that sometimes we as adults struggle to grasp. Uh, I think for children, they're very kind of tan tangible, tactile people. So they give thanks for what's kind of right in front of them. And I feel like that's um, such a gift for us as adults who get kind of way ahead of ourselves. We worry about all the things that we can't control. And over the last two years, everything has been about what we cannot control. And for children, they give thanks for being right there. They're, you know, thankful that there's chocolate milk and <laughs> they get to use their favorite Snoopy plate. Uh, so kind of seeing, uh, Thanksgiving through the eyes of children really helps us to kind of get to what Thanksgiving really is about, is being grateful for what's right in front of us. Rob Marzino, uh, Thanksgiving 2021 versus 12 months ago, we're going into the, the depths of COVID at, at that point. What will you say this year versus what you said last year? Sure. Um, my experience last year was similar to Grace. There's a multiple clergy in my family. And so usually I don't have to pray. That's something that my dad does. However, this year, last year, we were not with my family. We were just with my uh, nuclear family, just my two girls and my husband. And we were joking beforehand that the uh, prayer was like, oh, please, God, let these kids behave. Because we were all together with our families, like in the space, the same space for a very long time. And um, of course we are so grateful that we, were, we, we had the opportunity to be together and that was lovely. Um, and there were some people that weren't able to be together and we, we definitely counted our blessings. However, there is um, a great freedom and joy in that now a year later, the, the kids have more freedom. They're outside the walls of our house. They're engaging in relationships outside of the walls of our house. Um, we will be with larger family this coming Thanksgiving and, and, and able to give thanks that we can gather together and maybe some of the uh, more tedious aspects of quarantining with young children. Um, again, uh, we can look back on uh, maybe a little bit with fondness, whereas in the moment, it's, it's a little bit crazy making, actually. Larry Hayward, I have to say I'm a little surprised that you're not always the one who's, who's asked to give the blessing. <laughs> well, well, I'm married to a minister, for one thing, and uh, we are usually with, with her family in some form, and there are other clergy in that family. One, one thing I've always appreciated, I've sometimes taken a pass when I'm asked to give a blessing at a meal, 
you know, I'll just say, nope, I'm not on duty. Or, But part of that is I really enjoy hearing hosts give blessings, and, and particularly non-ordained hosts. I mean, I've heard you give a prayer. I've heard, you know, members of this church or members of, you know, of my wife's family or our family give a prayer, and it's always really inspiring to a minister to hear somebody give a prayer that is better than what you would have done, you know, or is just really sort of speaks to the heart. So that's what I most remember. Also inspiring sometimes to hear people of different faiths talk about sure. prayer. Yeah. So yeah. explain what this is, why we're doing this. Okay, we're, we're doing this because for many decades, much further than, than I can know or remember, three of the congregations represented here, Westminster and Trinity Methodist and Aguda Sakim, have, um, have had a you, what used to be a Thanksgiving Eve worship service. And we would rotate it between the three uh, congregations uh, and, and three different you know, persons leading the sermon. Uh, last year, we were not able to do this. And we, we videoed the four of us standing in your courtyard with your husband taking a video. And it was very windy. And we just did, we kind of all repeated a, a blessing that we had from our tradition. Uh, Robin we and her church of St. Clement joined this threesome in 2017 um, and this year we just sort of came up with the idea of asking you and asking Alex to do something more substantive that we will again release to our four congregations next week. In hearing you all talk about Thanksgiving 2021 versus 20, I got a sense of optimism that, that this is maybe a more optimistic prayer this year. Uh, so a question to, to any of you, what do you say to the member of your congregation who's not ready to be optimistic yet or after the, the setbacks of the Delta variant and the stops and starts all along the way, what do you say to that person this year? Anyone? I can take that, yeah. We've been talking about that at our church about what it means to reclaim joy this year. And uh, last year we talked a lot about like, there was so much not to be grateful for. Like we were seeing you know, the worst thing that you can imagine, a global pandemic that had killed so many people, hospitals were overrun, and what it means to give gratitude, not when things are good, but when things are really terrible. And, we, and I think there's kind of two approaches to it. The first might be somebody who says like, um, who kind of dismisses or downplays everything. Like, oh, that's not that big of a deal, so we should just be grateful for what we have. And it kind of puts blinders on in big things. But the other approach is to be really cynical <laughs> and to be like, well, that's how the world is. You know, what can we do, right? And what it means for us to reclaim gratitude, maybe the way that our faith ancestors had approached gratitude as not just giving up or giving in, uh, but as an act of faith. Um, there's a great um, writer, Diana Butler Bass, who talks about gratitude as um, an act of resistance against anger, against evil, against hatred. And that it's not acquiescing to evil, but it's instead resisting evil. And what does gratitude look like this year if when everything is falling apart around us, when this has lasted like so much longer than we ever <laughs> imagined, for us to claim gratitude as an act of our faith? Rabbi Rain, that question of people who aren't quite ready to be optimistic? So I, I sometimes think a lot about active listening. What does it mean to really listen to someone? I feel like for the last number of months, you know, so many of us get caught up in sort of trying to point out the, the holes in someone's own behaviors. Oh, you, you, how can you do this, but you won't do that? Or like, you're crazy because you're coming together for worship. You're crazy because you won't come together. Right? At some point, you, know, you have to recognize that these are not all rational decisions. These are emotional decisions. And you, know, you have to honor people's emotions and, and listen to them and, and really hear where they're coming from and acknowledge that wherever they are is where they are supposed to be. And to the extent that they want and need uh, an embrace to help them get to wherever the next step is on their own personal uh, spiritual journey towards sort of, sort of re-entering this world is you know, I think where I see my, my role, role in that, uh, not in sort of coercing someone to do that which they're not yet comfortable doing. Robin Rosina, 20 months into this journey of COVID, and the pandemic and being a faith leader in the pandemic, how has it changed you as a faith leader? Uh, 
I was ready to answer that question. <laughs> um, how has it changed me as a faith leader? Um, I think it has helped me focus on the leadership role of being the one that holds the hope in a congregation that through something like this, um, who is on the forefront of naming the blessings. I mean, it, it has been a difficult year for um, faith communities, for our faith communities, but I think for a lot, there's less people coming to our worship services because especially with children being unvaccinated um, until real recently, they haven't been um, interested in coming back. Um, the, the financial situation is difficult. We at St. Clement have lost two of our greatest outreach ministries on indefinite hiatus. So for instance, um, we used to serve as a hypothermia shelter for the city of Alexandria for decades. And last year was the first year we didn't need to serve as a hypothermia shelter because the city thankfully had other resources and um, uh, and there's similar, same thing is happening this year. The, the city has, has made arrangements for um, homeless men to be able to be housed uh, for, for nights when it's cold. But that has been like, a, that's, a, that's the beating heart of our congregation, our mission. It's relational, it's bringing people into our sanctuary to sleep, you know, three nights, or it was six nights a year, and now it's three nights a year. And we don't have that, so as a leader, um, it's 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 managing change. It's just man. We've had to pivot over and over and over again in um, COVID times. But now we have to really re we have to start reimagining who we are um, because we're a changed congregation. And so we are not the congregation that met in February of 2020 when I remember meeting with our vestry, our board, and we were ready to rock and roll. We were going to do all these wonderful things, and then a month later we weren't even. Um, meeting together in worship and so when we are all we are slowly coming back and slowly regathering and we're a changed people and a changed congregation so as a leader i have to manage change and 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 also do so while holding hope and and um letting folks know that we are still working towards meeting the dream of god as a congregation it's just going to look different larry hayward is westminster a changed congregation I think it is, and, and I, the only reason I say I think is I, th is I think we're in the process of figuring out how, how it's changed. I mean, you, obviously there are less people here, um, but we had a, a lengthy discussion in staff yesterday about, I think it's an open question as to whether, whether our role in the future is going to be to rebuild or as she said, to reimagine. I mean, is it, is it a matter of just, okay, we need to go back and recapture the people we haven't seen and rebuild the programs that we had? Or is it, uh, is what we are seeing what we've got and we need to think about how we go forward with what we've got? It's probably a little bit of both. Grace Hahn, Steve Marine, yeah, similar okay. reactions? Yeah, I mean, obviously, like this has like fundamentally shifted everything. Uh, and so we're, we're kind of in this process of like, you know, we need to do a strategic visioning. We need to think about what's next. At the same time, we are coming upon our 250th anniversary in 2024. We were founded in 1774. And so at the same time that we're kind of thinking about what's next, we're also reflecting back on, hey, God has been faithful to, for 250 years. <laughs> you know, like Trinity yeah. has seen, lived through the Revolutionary War, through the Civil War, through denominational splits over slavery. Like the church has lived through a lot and God has been faithful throughout that. So how do we kind of hold intention here, this like, okay, we're clearly entering this different season, you know, like we are putting in cameras and upgrading our AV system because we are moving into a season of hybrid worship and that is the future. And at the same time, we're holding intention, like this great history that we have that demonstrates God's faithfulness throughout it. Uh, so at the same time that we're seeing change, we're also kind of celebrating and recognizing the great history that we have as well. It's an important question, so I want to give you a chance um, to respond to. I, one of the questions that I received so many times in the last number of months is like, when, when are we going back to normal? Yeah. And yeah. I think the answer is we're not. We're not, we're not going back, like we're, we're moving forward. You know, I, I think about the, you know, the, the, the journey of the Israelites after they left Egypt and you know, there's some, you know, they, you know, can't we just go back? You know, it was so comfortable back then. And you know, the answer is like, no, we're not going back there. We have, a, we have a bright future ahead of us. We need to create that future. 
but the future is not about returning to the, to the past. You know, I think the past informs who we are and who we will be. But uh, as, as Robin said, it's really a lot about sort of reimagining uh, what our future can be. And I think if we to simply just go back to where we were, it almost eliminates all that we've learned. I think we've, we've learned and grown a lot in the last uh, 20 months. On the, I do think ahead. it's worth mentioning, though, that the Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years before they got to Canaan. <laughs> so it might take us some time and some patience to kind of figure out what that next step looks like. Yeah, and that's, I mean, something, something that I feel is that you keep expecting this point where, like, there's going to be a ticker, day, ticker tape parade because the pandemic's over. And we've passed through two or three of those, right. and you realize it's probably not going to be over. I mean, there's not going to be this one definitive point where everybody just comes back, returns to normal, you know, or whatever. But I think, I think something that, that is an issue is is just the fatigue level. To really reimagine your future involves uh, a lot of effort and thought, and you've sort of got to be in a frame of mind to do that. And I think part of what we're, we're struggling with is just sort of the care of souls now and giving people a break, you know, rather than, okay, folks, now it's time to think about all these changes we're going to make. I mean, I can just see that we are, you know, so it's just, it's a timing issue almost. Before we get to the, the future, a question on the present. So another Thanksgiving in the shadow of the nation's capital and polls show that the country is as divided as it's ever been. Uh, did you think during the pandemic that we would be closer together at this point, 20 months of going through pandemic together as a nation, as a world, would we not be as divided, Rob and Lucina? I didn't. I don't know that I had that thought whether we would be divided or not because of the pandemic. Because so much of it was reactive, and we didn't know at any point what was going to happen the next month. Um, I can see now how um, I, I wouldn't have thought a pandemic would divide like it has divided um, people. I would have thought it would have brought people closer. However, I think that there there are instances of people being brought close together and i think what what i have noticed is that when people share their stories um, people are cl brought close together and you can see the camaraderie and the relationship and the sisterhood brotherhood of people i think of something um, i always follow humans of new york on on facebook and instagram and it's people telling stories and people connect to the story and then they, they support, uh, sometimes like financially support these people in, in their lives and overcoming so many obstacles. And I think we would do, we would all do this. If we all heard a, someone's story that we don't agree with, if we sat down and listened to their story, then I think we would not have the problems that we have right now. We don't have the opportunity to sit. You were talking about active listening being so important. We don't have this opportunity to sit and listen to another story. We hear a sound bite and um, it triggers something in us and, and we, re we react rather than um, respond. So, um, you know, the pandemic, I don't know how much of it, had, the pandemic has led to that or just uh, where it's too bad that maybe the pandemic didn't bring us closer with some of the other challenges we have, perhaps it could have brought us closer and maybe it was a missed opportunity. If a pandemic can be an opportunity, I don't know that, I don't know. And, and it's not for lack of prayer, right? I, I know, at least at Westminster, we, we pray to bring this country closer together. So, Larry, why aren't we? Why aren't we closer together? As a country. Uh, I don't know. I, th I think, I think one of the reasons we're not is that the, that the pandemic has given people the opportunity to think. And a lot of that thoughtfulness has gone to dark places, you know, has gone to differences. I mean, they, they've got the time to, the time and the, maybe the mood or the anger to just pursue uh, their grievances, you know, whatever they are. So I think that's, in some ways, the, the pandemic has made it worse. Um, I don't think the divisions over the pandemic are divisions over the pandemic. I think they're, they're expressions of pre-existing divisions that we've had. Uh, I'll, but I also have to say that I think 
generally in this community and in this congregation, we've been spared most of the, the anger and, and divisiveness that, that you see you know, on, that I know. on your show. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I was living in, uh, in Manhattan on uh, 9-11, and that was sort of, in my mind, sort of you know, one of the last sort of major tragic moments in this nation. And in the aftermath of that, we saw a nation coming together. <clears throat> I remember watching the World Series game at, at Yankee Stadium when the president comes out to throw out the first pitch. And it didn't really care whether or you, were, you were wearing a blue jersey or a red jersey, or everyone was just thrilled or that the president of the United States was, was, was there. Uh, and in this instance, I'm not sure we, we, didn't, we didn't really see that. But we saw sort of micro communities coming together. And maybe because the nature of this tragic moment was everything became hyper-local. And so many of us live with and among people who are very similar to us. So, I mean, right, Larry, you mentioned that how your community was, was spared some of the division, but in many ways, right, our communities are made up of somewhat like-minded types of yeah. individuals. And I don't mean just sort of like on a partisan level. I mean, sort of, you know, if, if they're radically different, they're probably in a different church or living yeah. in a different community. Yeah. Uh, so in, in that sense, because we, we kind of sort of hunkered down within our own echo chambers, kind of reinforced that um, those divisions, that, as you said, were, were there before the pandemic and then just sort of became exacerbated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to uh, pick up on something Larry had said about what might be kind of behind or what underneath some of that division. And I think there is this kind of general sense of anxiety and frustration that was certainly there before the pandemic. But with the pandemic, I mean, it was this kind of sense of like collectively the world disappointed us, right? Like the rug was pulled out from under us for everyone. And, uh, and I think that I wonder if that is a kind of spiritual crisis that we're facing. Um, and, you know, it has manifested itself in a number of different kind of ways. But, you know, how do we live in a world where like... Um, where everything that we thought was true was kind of pulled out from under us and like all of our plans got canceled, school was canceled, church was never canceled, you know, our faith communities were never canceled, but it looks so different. And how do we respond to that? And I, I wonder if some of the kind of division is a response to trying to process some of our frustration and anxiety and fear that uh, was always there, but the pandemic certainly brought this to kind of a really deeper level than we had ever faced before. I've been wondering about that is what, what are we going through as a, as a nation as a as a world kind of spiritually in response to what the pandemic has offered to us and grace i think um when i think about myself when i'm in pain i'm not at my best self i'm not at my most generous i am i'm inward thinking i'm i'm i'm, I'm consumed by what i'm going through and i think um not only has there been anxiety and fear, but there's been a lot of pain. Like we have gone through a lot of pain. We've lost, we've gone through the emotional pain of losing people we've loved. We've gone through the pain of watching people simply move away. Um, we've watched um, the pain of people not getting the same type of health care because they don't have resources that other people get. Um, so, so in our pain, uh, and, I, and I'm thinking myself, but then I think collectively, it's just sometimes hard to be our best selves when we're really in the dark, in that dark place. And so I think some, some of what we're seeing is people sort of lashing out from their place of deep pain. And as faith leaders, you know, we, we draw on our prayer, we, we pray for healing. Um, and, 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 you know, we, we think about, you know, I'm praying that, that, that we can move beyond our pain and our grief and, um, and our anxiety uh, as, as, as individuals, but as, as a community as well. I, I would say too, one of the, just listening to, to what Robin was saying, one of the things we have to offer that's, that's really neat is ancient liturgies and practices that continue. And I know when we, you know, when we made the decision to shut down, you know, with, with Alex on the phone and we were live streamed 36 hours later, I mean, we just as clergy intentionally said we are going to go in to the chancel. There will be no one else in the building other than, than the cameras uh, and do what we've always done so that people who are watching it can see something that's the same. And I think, uh, I think that as much as things have changed, uh, 
you know, we do go back to being in the wilderness in Israel. I mean, all of our, all of our traditions represent something that is centuries old and older than 250 years even. <laughs> in some sense that, you know, that the blessings of God will be with us in the future and, and will get us through this. And, and that in itself is maybe, maybe just the visual presence. And I know when people have come back here for the first time after a year or two years away, you know, they, they literally are moved to tears just hearing the organ or being back in the building. It doesn't mean they're going to come back next week. You know, it doesn't mean they, they feel safe to do that. But there's just a connection with something that's very ancient that right. gets us through, you know, that gets us through this time. Robin, you were talking about what, what you pray for as we come to the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, so in looking it up, I, I've learned there's, there's several different kinds of prayer. There's prayers of confession. There's prayers of intercession. Uh, there's, I wrote them all down, so I would have them. There's prayer of petition. Uh, but thanksgiving and, and praise is a, its own category of prayer, right? Is, as we talk about a divided country or even divisions in family, is a thanksgiving prayer, a prayer of thanksgiving, the best kind of prayer, not just to speak to God, but to bring people together? I, I think that uh, it's a great way. <laughs> it's, I mean, I think there are, gratitude is, is, is I think one of those um, gateway prayers, right? You know, it's, 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 it's easy to do to, to talk with children or to talk with others, to practice. It, you, prayer is very much a practice. And so um, gratitude is, is, is a wonderful way to help you become aware of of your surroundings and your situation and and I think you know Thanksgiving obviously gives us this opportunity to 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 have a whole day a whole opportunity to to really to to give thanks to to pray and and thank God for all the blessings that we have and it's wonderful to have the permission and the day set aside just to be just to be grateful um, and I think that that's not gonna hurt um, in, in any way so I um, as we come towards the end here, uh, I used Google, and uh, I Googled Psalms of Thanksgiving, uh, and uh, Psalm 136 kept coming up as a Psalm of Thanksgiving. So Rabbi Rain, what should people know about Psalm 136? So there's a phrase that repeats over and over and over again. Uh, in Hebrew, it's ki leolam chasto, uh, translated uh, as where God's love is everlasting or will endure. And I think, for me, what's most important, right, over and over again, we're, this is the psalm mentions how God continues to love despite uh, everything. And you know, I think if, if, if all we take away from that is simply that God loves us and that's it, I think we're missing an important piece. Right? Because part of uh, our role as, as human beings is to, is to look at God as an example. And if God can love humanity despite all that we do, and perhaps we could also learn to love fellow humanity, fellow human beings, despite all that they do as well. Had any of you used Psalm 136 much in, in your work, in your ministry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the word that stood out to me, and it, I don't think it's in this translation, but another translation is this word, steadfast. God's yeah. steadfast love endures forever. And that that idea of steadfastness in a season where nothing has been steadfast, when things are so up and down, I think has provided, um, can provide a sense of comfort and reassurance for all of us when we're facing all the ups and downs. So that's a word that I've been really focusing on, that steadfast, God's steadfast love endures forever. Before we read it, any thoughts on 136? It was a good choice. Google served you well. <laughs> so. And certainly, I mean, COVID feels like COVID's going to endure forever. You know, that idea that it's just going to go on and on, but we can rest in the nearness of God who is always with us as we go through forever. There's no time limit on God's nearness to us and, and God's um, uh, relationship so, so that we can find peace in that. Well, we'll end by reading it together. Larry has the first section. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. God's love endures forever.
To God who alone does great wonders, God's love endures forever. Who by God's understanding made the heavens, God's love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, God's love endures forever. Who made the great lights, God's love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, God's love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night, God's love endures forever. He remembered us in our lowest state, God's love endures forever, and freed us from our enemies, God's love endures forever. He gives food to every creature, God's love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, God's love endures forever. God's love endures forever. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Happy Thanksgiving.